Our seventh session for today is, it's 10 p.m. Do you know what's happening in the library? An exploration of hourly, hourly library usage data presented by Hillary Thompson and James Spring from University of Maryland Libraries. Hillary Thompson is the Director of User Services and Resource Sharing at the University of Maryland Libraries, where she has worked in various access services roles since 2012. Throughout her time at UMD, she has expanded data gathering and reporting efforts within her unit and encouraged the use of data to inform decisions about library services and collections. James Spring is the manager of the library services unit in the user services and resource sharing department at the University of Maryland Libraries. He also serves as the co-manager of the library's virtual reference services where he collects and analyzes transaction data for internal and external reporting as well as service improvement. All right. And with that, I will stop my share and uh, you folks can begin. Great, thank you so much. Yep. Just a moment to get our slides up and running. There we go, all right. Good afternoon, everyone. James and I, we are excited to share with you the work we're doing with hourly usage data at McKeldin Library, which is the main library at the University of Maryland College Park. A little bit about McKeldin for background and context. It is a fairly large high traffic library with approximately 850,000 visits per year. We serve not only the 40,000 students and 14,000 faculty staff here at UMD, but also the wider community. Um, we are open to the public. And for most of the year, McKeldin is open seven days per week. Um, and we're also open 24 five during the fall and spring semesters. And we have two service points, one each on the first and second floors that are staffed whenever McKeldin is open. Next slide, please. So last summer, James and I started exploring data that was already being collected um, by our systems and by our employees in order to better understand when and how our library is being used. Our investigation was prompted by a confluence of events that either have and or will affect library usage and staffing levels in the near future, um, including the obvious, the COVID-19 pandemic, which not only affected student usage, but also the library's budget and the depth of our department staffing bench. Um, we're dealing with things like isolation periods and buildup of use it or lose it annual leave. Um, other factors included a 7% decrease in permanent staffing, between 2019 and 2020 um, due both to pandemic related budget cuts, um, but also to shifting administrative priorities. Um, and we've also um, been trying to grapple with a shrinking budget for student employees that's also trying to absorb a 36% increase in the minimum wage. So although McKeldin's hours have remained more or less the same for the past decade, um, it's really become apparent over the past year that these hours may not be sustainable moving forward, at least not without additional resources. Um, this is really what led us to explore hourly usage data for our services and our spaces with an eye towards maximizing what the library can offer with its current resources. Um, in other words, looking at how we could use data to identify where um, painless or less painful cuts could be made if needed, but also with an eye towards advocating for more funding that is using the data to make the case for maintaining our hours if the data does in fact support that. So that's a brief summary um, of the context and our motivations for undertaking this work. I'm gonna hand things over now to James who will tell you more about our data and what we did with it. James, I think you need to unmute yourself. Thank you. Blast. Sorry about that. Thanks, everybody. Um, okay, so let's talk about what data we looked at and where it came from. Uh, we broke up data into semesters. That's fall, spring, winter, and summer. Uh, and we started with fall 2019 and then picked back up with fall 2020. Obviously, we didn't want to collect data for those times that we were closed. Um, what data did we collect? We sort of looked at gate counts for our whole building, number one. We collected both traffic and occupancy data. Traffic is pretty easy. Uh, we counted the number of ends collected by our people counter system for our three public entrances. Uh, for occupancy, we use an occupancy add-on that they offer called Safe Space. It can be purchased from the people counter vendor. Um, again, looking at only our three public entrances. 
with occupancy, we collected both hourly average and hourly max occupancy, because those can be pretty different and uh, make a difference in what you're looking at. For circulation of materials, we did want to look at all the work that was done. So we looked, included loans, returns, and items scanned for in-house use, in-house use being not checked out, but scanned after being pulled off of the shelf. Uh, we were able to request some custom hourly reports from our IT staff. Uh, a lot of back and forth went into making that custom set of reports work. Uh, and we're going to keep talking about this, but collaboration is really important um, for getting data from all these different places. Uh, we had some existing relationships, thankfully, built up over time, and they came in pretty handy. Um, and then interactions uh, was our last thing we were counting. And that's there's so many questions that are asked at our service points that aren't really part of an automated transaction counter. Uh, and we ask our service point employees to manually input these using SpringShare's LibAnswers product. Uh, we collected the data reported by library students and staff at the first floor service point only at this time, because the second floor service point hadn't really implemented the procedure for entering the question data uh, during the analyze periods. Some challenges. This is my big slide. I get to talk a lot. I get to air our dirty laundry, so to speak. Um, you can't really uh, interpret data that isn't recorded. And our question data is entered manually. And when that's the case, numbers are just going to skew lower, likely, than actual questions answered. Uh, sort of anecdotally, some of our staff reported sometimes there'd be a question input missed, in fact, due to the large volume of users needing help at the time, just taking priority over the data entry itself. Um, also, a number of our questions were asked via our chat service, which started in 2020, or which changed big in 2020. Uh, the biggest change being that our chat is now a widget on every page of our website. Uh, to put that set of changes into numbers, uh, before we added that widget, about 1.4% of all questions coming in uh, were, during, were from chat. And uh, since August 2021, we've averaged about 14% of all of our questions coming from chat. And while we could have left those numbers out, it's still being performed by our service point staff during their desk shifts. So we thought, well, let's leave those in. Um, and when looking at reports um, from all these different systems, it's important to note the times of day when bulk tasks are scheduled to avoid uh, misinterpreting spikes in circulation numbers, um, especially when returning from extended close periods. Uh, not that this data should be thrown out, it's still work that needs to be done. It's just not time sensitive and shouldn't be thought of in an hourly uh, way. Uh, circulation data can be skewed by opening times, holiday closures, scheduled pull time for uh, hard copy materials, or even book drops uh, being done. Uh, weekly meetings can also affect data if they change over time. So keep those in mind. Um, next was occupancy data. It was sort of tricky to configure. Uh, it's an external system uh, that had a, a setup before we got a chance to look at it. And so we were seeing a weird drop off at about 4 a.m. And when we finally dug deep, uh, it turned out that the, originally, the original occupancy setup was resetting our count at uh, back to zero at 4 a.m. And that's fine during the summer when it was set up, when we're closed all night, but when we were actively trying to analyze our late night trends, like between 11 p.m. and 7 a.m., it was a big problem. So uh, some other limitations we ran into were like when we're trying to fix that, like how might we do those resets was sort of staff time and adding manual resets, um, ballooning numbers towards the end of a week when we hadn't closed. Uh, those are like missed exits by, by contractors, couriers, university staff, uh, students using emergency exits, all kinds of little things. Um, and also when adding manual uh, resets, our cloud-based system actually needed literal days to recalculate everything. Um, so what we ended up needing to do was that we kept that automated like reset to zero, but we moved it to 7 a.m. And that was based on the traffic data we had and our understanding of our procedures. It was the least, uh, it was the time least likely to affect uh, the data that we wanted to look at. So it does mean that some occupancy data right after seven could be a bit low, um, but it sort of evens out over the day. Uh, we were also sort of stymied by some tasks that have data someplace, but not within our reach. Um, so we, we do we deal with printing, we create guest accounts. There's um, a lot of hardware that gets used in our building and we just don't have access to that data. Um, but even with those limits, we were not deterred. Uh, so Hillary, would you uh, let us know what we did with all of our imperfect data? Sure. Um, so we're gonna talk now about applying the data. This is my favorite part. Um, I am not a math or numbers person, but I do really enjoy visualizing and interpreting data. Um, an initial disclaimer um, for the, the section of the presentation, 
even though McKeldin's uh, phased reopening um, you know, with the pandemic, um, that concluded with the start of the fall 2021 semester. Um, so it's been, you know, been over a year now that we've been fully reopened. Um, despite that, we have been hesitant to make or recommend significant changes in library hours or in employee staffing based solely on last year's academic, um, last academic year's data um, due to concerns over how the pandemic may have influenced um, the numbers. Questions we have been asking ourselves this year include, um, are usage patterns from last, last year indicative of um, our new normal and what can we expect um, to see in this academic year and beyond? Or do they reflect a year of transition on the way to new normal with disruptions due to the Omicron variant surge? which um, for us um, in Maryland um, and around DC hit us particularly hard in both December and January of last year. Um, so only, only time will tell or help us answer these questions. In the meantime, we have started with smaller changes, namely making some adjustments to our scheduled close dates. McAlden is open most days of the year. Historically, we have closed only for UMD employee holidays and weekends between semesters. Um, that comes to about 34 days per year that we are closed, depending on how our holidays and academic calendar falls. There were already additional days that we were interested in closing. Um, that is days in which classes aren't being held, but technically are not employee holidays. Historically, these have been slow days at our service points and also very difficult days in terms of employee scheduling. The 2021 and 2022 data reinforced what we already suspected, that it just didn't make sense for us to be open on those eight particular days. And the data helped us successfully advocate for closing on those dates this year. So let's take a look at some of that data. On the left, you'll see average space usage on top and average service point activity on the bottom for Saturdays during the fall 2021 semester. On the right, you'll see the same for the Saturday after Thanksgiving. When you compare the two side by side, the difference, especially in terms of space usage, is quite striking. Total traffic for the Saturday after Thanksgiving was only 14% of what we typically saw on Saturdays that semester. Service point usage was likewise very low throughout the day, um, altogether less than one third of what we typically see on Saturdays. In the interest of time, I'm just showing you data visualizations for one of the eight dates, but we did the same analyses and saw very similar disparities for the other seven days in question. Next slide, please. Moving forward, I'm hoping this data can help us optimize employee scheduling at service points and inform longer term adjustment of hours or our student employee budget. As I mentioned earlier, we don't wanna base any major decisions to our fall and spring hours based on last year's data, but if we see the, similar, the same or similar numbers in the 2022 and 2023 data, then this data starts to become actionable. In the meantime, we're looking for patterns and outliers, peaks and lulls, and discussing options should they continue in 2022 to 2023. Um, for example, um, from 2 to 8 a.m., which is part of our late night study period, um, this actually turned out to be the least active time period of any fall or spring day hour combination, both for space usage and for service point activity. Um, so it's definitely something we're having conversations about and keeping an eye on. Next slide, please. We also no uh, noted significant variance in activity levels at service points during different hours um, of the day. Um, but historically, we have usually staffed our service points with the same number of student employees um, throughout most of the day and evening. Um, so the data really suggests that that approach needs some rethinking. Another interesting pattern that emerged. As previously mentioned, we have two service points in our main library, both of which are open whenever the library is open. We have the library services desk, whose data is shown in red. This is a merged circulation and reference desk on our first floor that provides a wide range of access and information services. This is the desk that James manages. We also have our TLC tech desk shown in yellow. Um, it's based in the learning commons on our second floor and provides equipment loan and support for room reservations and specialized printing. During most of the year, we see a healthy mix of activity from both of our service points um, as seen in the two graphs on the left-hand side that represent fall and spring. And winter and summer uh, 2022, however, 
Nearly all the service point activity occurred at the first floor desk, with extremely little activity happening up on the second floor. Logically, this makes sense. The second floor service point services are geared towards students, in particular undergraduate students, many of whom are not on campus during the winter and summer. However, the degree of difference was very surprising, both to me as department director and also to our new head of learning commons. If this trend continues in 2023, it opens questions as to if and when this desk needs to be open during winter and summer, and it would certainly prompt a closer look at how many student employees we are scheduling at the second floor desk during these two terms. All right, so that pretty much covers uh, what we've done with this data um, and learned from it to date. I'm going to hand you back over to James to share our future plans and wrap us up. Thanks, Hillary. Um, As we move forward, some of the things we're thinking of adding to this project, because we're going to keep doing it, um, is we're going to sort of keep collecting the data that we have been collecting so we can establish some trends and use those trends to inform some of those decisions uh, Hillary was talking about. Um, just as a sneak peek, so far, uh, when we look back at fall 22, 2022, it is lining up with our existing findings. So we have a trend. Um, we're also hoping to work with some university partners to unlock some of that missing service data. Um, specifically, uh, we're going to try and get printing data, guest account creation, some Wi-Fi connections in the building, and then computer lab login counts. Um, lastly, we're sort of looking at uh, particular days or weeks within the university calendar that we haven't looked at yet. Um, some of the things that people in the frontline staff are interested in when I talk to them about it um, are so finals weeks versus average, and then um, even some of our sports, our football game days versus average are some of the things that they're, that they're interested in seeing. Um, we do wanna conclude with a quick set of suggestions for anybody else here who does wanna undertake this kind of work. Um, please, please contextualize, communicate, your reasons for undertaking data collection and assessment as you collect the data, and especially when sharing your results, making it clear what you're talking about so it's not just a ton of numbers in a chart. Um, I think we did that a little bit with our little yellow pop-outs. So where did all it go? Where did all the yellow go? Um, so also be sure to communicate what uh, factors are influencing that data. Otherwise, people who are not there uh, or aren't doing what the work that you're doing might interpret your results without having all the facts. Uh, collaboration. Number two, collaboration is super important. Service experts and IT folks, data analyzers, need to collaborate and bring their experience and expertise to the table. Uh, the sooner collaboration can begin, the better. Um, lots of odd spikes and configuration things can be explained if your collaborators are there to talk to you about what's happening when you collect that and analyze that data. Uh, third, document your work. Don't assume you'll be able to pick right up where you left off a year ago. Uh, if you don't record your methods, you can't reproduce your work over time, and you won't be able to identify trends or really do it well. Um, if you can't collect the same data in a similar manner semester to semester and year to year. Um, also, you'll want to make sure others at your institution can do it if you're no longer able to do so, if you happen to move around. Um, and lastly, don't let perfection be a deterrent. Our hourly data is not perfect. That was my big slide. Um, it's overcounting in some places, it's undercounting in others. Those are weaknesses that uh, we can acknowledge, you can acknowledge, share as disclaimers, but the overall trends derived from our data are still valuable and have given us a much better understanding of when and how our library is being used um, than we would have had without. So thanks everyone. Uh, any questions, we'd love to answer them. Okay, thank you. If anyone has any questions, please uh, put them in the q and I'm not seeing any at the moment. So we'll give it a couple minutes. We did have a number of, of quick questions, but I think James and I have mostly been answering those um, as we've been going along. But we would definitely welcome more, more questions. Yeah, even a follow-up on one we did answer would be okay. <laughs> yeah, and I, I also noted, um, Anna, Anna, I totally agree with you. Perfection is an enemy of good. I think that's really, you know, it's, it's a theme that comes up repeatedly in our work, and it's something I talk a lot about when talking about not only this data, but other data. There is limits to what we can do with the data. Um, it's not perfect, but it certainly doesn't mean that we can't um, utilize and ensure it as long as we understand um, what those limitations are. So Hillary is the boss, so she may want to um, speak to how did administration react to changing when the library was closed. 
Right, yeah. Um, so, so far we've made, like I said, we really haven't um, made uh, tr changes, I would say, to our library hours. Um, the only thing we've changed um, so far was our um, close dates. Um, when they, you know, I requested each year, um, I compile a list of close dates um, that are informed uh, by the previous year's dates um, and can recommend changes to my um, associate dean. Um, I think the um, request to changes was very um, understandable when presented um, with the data, um, when presented with the constraints around um, staff scheduling that we were really experiencing. And I do think people are very sensitive right now to employee burnout, um, to the significant staffing challenges that we have now been operating with for, gosh, three, three years, right? Three going on four, four years now. Um, so I think in the Pacific, uh, particular context of presenting um, the closed dates, um, it, you know, it's just, yes, we, um, you know, we approved from our associate dean. Um, we have been through all but the spring break ones. And to date um, that I'm aware of, there's been no concerns expressed or pushback, which I think speaks to the validity, validity of the data. Um, and the very little usage we were getting on those dates. Um, and I will add that the very little traffic that we did have anecdotally from what I observed working during spring break last year, it was predominantly community users, um, which yes, we are open to the community. That is an important part of our role um, as you know, land grant um, institution, library at a land grant institution, but it is not our primary audience. Um, so it really, um, as far as I'm aware, didn't really have an impact um, to date, hasn't really had an impact on our faculty, faculty and students. There were lots of questions coming in now. Here they are. <laughs> um, let's see, you just took one. So let me take the Martha's question about services. Um, so the the activity that we were looking at, um, we did separate. Uh, we have we too. We have, we have recording space usage um, as the people that are coming in, but um, again, I think previously somebody had asked about our whether we train our desk students, our service point students, to record CERC data, and I, I said they don't record the CERC data, but they do record um, data uh, with uh, regard to like questions, how to find things in the catalog, whether they're helping with printing, directional queries, so um, and whether or not we're uh, referring those people to come up to the desk to ask questions um, to other places around campus or other library units. So we are counting services in um, in our hourly data too. So I'll say yes for that one. Yeah. I may have said uh, no to somebody else on there. Oops. All right, um, I will take, do staff have to take vacation um, on those dates? Um, no, no, they do not. Um, and that's actually something we thought about very carefully um, before um, recommending um, the close dates. Um, we usually provide um, a number of options in this scenario. If you're normal, um, the shift you're normally scheduled to work if we are closed during that time. Um, it de does depend on um, the unit um, and the person's um, individual job duties, but we can we offer a range of options that include um, adjusting the schedule for the week. Um, the opportunity to work on more operational tasks when the library is closed, in particular project work um, or professional development, um, the option to telework um, on those days, um, and then leave, of course, is an option um, if someone would really like to use it, um, and providing opportunities for our evening and our weekend staff to use the leave that they earn is also really, um, really important to us as well, so it's, it's certainly an option, but definitely not a requirement. Um, I'm going to take Lindy's. Any tips on how to get students at service points to record stats? Um, yeah, absolutely. So a couple of different things uh, that we're doing. Um, number one, I think that uh, showing the students, uh, whenever we get students, we show them uh, the back end of our statistics. We explain to them that this is not going into a black hole, that um, look at this hourly usage. I even let on about this in the last like two years that we've been doing this. I've sort of been letting on that their question and uh, the questions that they're answering make a difference as to how we might propose funding their positions. So that when they realize that it's it's not that these numbers are useful, that it's not just busy work, um, they're much more apt to to jump in on the statistics. Um, additionally, making it very easy for them. Uh, I've we had a lot of people who were trying to do almost a report on every single uh, transaction that they were doing, and we said no, 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 no. It's just about recording statistics. This is not a test to see if you know the right answer. So 
really getting in uh, an understanding about what they think it's for and explaining what it actually is for um, can help a lot. Additionally, um, for a time when we were really low, uh, we actually put a little pop-up on the screen that reminded uh, people to do statistics and it popped up maybe every hour on the 15s to hit any new um, death shift. And that would remind people, oh, I just missed five of them, let me put them in. Um, and then lastly, I, um, uh, I, I have a couple of death shifts up at uh, the service point myself. And um, when I'm up there, I let the students know that uh, if they catch me not doing one, then I will buy them a drink at our coffee shop. So that's one, one option. <laughs> All right. Um, so again, so many good questions. Um, I'm looking at one that just recently came in. I meant to ask if you provide services after midnight, would those services be um, fulfilled by student workers? Yeah, so our late night study is a, is a full service um, late, night, uh, late night study. Um, we do have our service points open on both the first um, and the second floor. Um, so any, um, what we would typically consider access services, right? Circulation, equipment loan, course reserves, um, all of those services are available, um, as well as, you know, basic technology and information assistance whenever the library is open. Um, what we don't have is what I would consider sort of expert assistance, so there aren't librarians on call. Um, we don't have our billing experts um, or our reserves experts present, um, things like that. Um, and so that is, you know, we, um, it really enriched about 10 years ago when I first started at Maryland. Um, we really expanded late night from a study hall on just one to two floors to a full service model. Um, I, um, it was a really, I think, good choice for us at, at the time. And I think now it's, you know, sort of reflecting on um, how is that getting used? And I think the interesting thing in sort of the late night period is that late night looks, if you're talking about the beginning of late night versus the end of late night, that looks very, um, very different. So that's, that's currently how we're providing um, those services. And we do have um, three um, late night staff members, um, one for each desk floor. We have a manager um, that manages late night, um, and we do also have a number of student employees that both um, assist at the, the two desks, um, assist with the transition to late night, which involves checking IDs to make sure everyone in the building at that point um, is affiliated with the university, um, and they also assist with checking IDs um, at the door, um, as well as doing some book retrieval. We also filled um, hold and ILL requests um, during late night as well, so we have tried to make sure that um, when late night is in session, we're using those employees um, as robustly as possible to provide as full of an experience um, as possible. I wanna throw um, back to Holly's question about minimum staffing need. Um, it does change throughout the day and throughout the, um, the semester and even um, uh, at particular times of the semester. But one of the ways that we actually um, take a look at our minimum staffing need and can justify it is one of our questions we, we have in our statistical recording is, did you leave the desk for this transaction? And that actually lets us very, very strongly support the fact that we cannot have a service point with a single person at it, because if they have to leave that service point, um, then you're leaving an empty service point. So um, I would encourage anybody who doesn't, or who collects statistics to include a, did you have to leave the desk um, in your statistical um, uh, collection? I know it's not a full answer to the minimum staffing need, but uh, it's about as much as I can answer with, uh, with what we've done right now. Great, and I think maybe we have time for at least at least one more question. Um, so there, um, I'm gonna respond to Melinda's, which was, I love seeing the use of all the data we have available at our fingertips. Do you have methods or plans to gather end user data? Qualitative, if so, what are they? Um, this is a really, really great question. Um, I think we haven't um, gotten to that point um, of our work in this area um, yet. Um, so we're kind of starting with the, um, the easiest of the, of the data, the quantitative data. We then want to expand more of the quantitative data. And I think in particular in areas where we're looking at making changes. And so I think the end user qualitative piece um, would also be really important there. Um, if we decide that we wanna make um, a significant change, especially in our fall and spring hours, um, I think it would behoove us to um, you know, come up maybe, and again, if we have to do this for like budgetary purposes, I think it might behoove us to come up with a model or two um, and to start sharing that um, with, you know, whether it's focus groups, 
um, whether it's, you know, key student stakeholders like our student advisory group, um, which the libraries have, or whether it's student government, um, you know, certainly making sure that, you know, we're, we're looking at the data from a, like a library employee and a budget and a scheduling perspective. Um, we certainly want to center student needs as well. That's why we're looking at the data. But I think getting their, their perspectives about how we can optimize our hours um, in those areas making change, I, I think that would be really important. So um, no, no specific plans there, but um, I, I love the point that you've raised. And I really think that should be part of our um, planning if we're moving in a, a need to make big changes direction. Okay, I think that's all the time we have. There's still a few questions, but we're going to forward those to you after uh, today's conference, and uh, we'll get those answers out to uh, all attendees along with uh, the slide decks and recordings from today. So uh, check your inboxes for everyone who uh, is attending. Uh, there, there will be an email in the future with uh, links to everything. So thank you again to uh, the two of you for presenting. That was um, Another great presentation, really, really useful. And uh, now we're going to move on to our next one.